Hello and welcome to another uh, Ray Orden video. On this video, uh, I decided to talk about my uh, most recent purchase, and that is Rossi Revolver. This one, uh, I bought it from Shields, and it was a uh, used gun. It's the first time I'm buying a used gun. I, uh, typically, I wasn't into really uh, buying a used guns, other than, you know, maybe a couple, you know, from gun shows, but not from a store. And I just, uh, you know, I just wanted to give it a, give it a shot. And I, I bought this Rossi Revolver. And I want to share this uh, gun with you. And I have a little story uh, with this gun. That's the, that's the part, actually, I want to also share with you. So uh, this is, as you see, as, uh, one of the models that Rossi, uh, Rossi came up with. Uh, as, you, uh, as you guys know, or some of you uh, may know maybe better than others, Rossi kind of made a comeback. Uh, with three models uh, back to the uh, revolver market and they being so far mostly manufacturing uh, rifles and uh, they used to produce uh, manufacture handguns revolvers and they stopped and they discontinued for a while and then they they came back um, relatively recently and this is one of those uh, three models this is a six inch model uh, 357 uh, magnum and uh, like I said, I bought that. I thought the price was good uh, used, and the, the price was only two hundred fifty dollars. I thought, you know, I just want to give it a shot. You know, why not? It's not a terrible price, right? Two hundred fifty dollars. So, uh, so I just went ahead and bought that, and and then uh, I came back. I came home and I was following with that. Uh, I haven't shot it yet. And the next day, I think it was the next day, and I was following with it and. Notice that the the cylinder was kind of uh, getting a little rougher to get it out of its housing. So once it was here, and I'm just uh, you know pushing that latch to release the uh, cylinder, and it got to the point that almost being stuck. And in, in fact, it was badly stuck. Eventually, I don't know. How I didn't realize that when I was, you know, you know, purchasing that, because obviously the guy pulled it out of the display and gave it to me, and I was following with it. That was the first thing I did was was checking the, you know, the cylinder as you as anyone would do normally, and I really don't remember feeling particular amount of, uh, or or unnatural amount of resistance, you know, from that uh, cylinder coming out of his housing like I was showing you here, but you know, I think then later on it occurred to me that well I think it was a little bit rougher than it should be somehow it escaped me I don't know maybe I just like the I just want the guy too badly I kind of you know my mind my brain blocked it I don't know I came home and I was following with that like I said eventually it got stuck badly so what I was doing was I was uh, I started kind of you know to basically move it I started kind of hitting on the edge of my table so when I was doing this, I want to share you what you know, the, share with you the picture that I took on my phone, and I want to I want to show that to you. See if you if you can see here now. Uh, I'm not sure if you can. Maybe it's this way. Uh, there you go. You can see that the ejection rod. Note that you know, kind of pay a little bit of closer attention. The ejection rod on this image is not straight it's bent so basically me forcing it uh i got it bent so the, here let me show you see it should be like this right completely perfectly absolutely straight with that little bit of a bent i mean it's not as visible on the picture i mean it's not doing as good of a job but it was impossible to basically snap it back and it should basically fit to this place right to its place it wasn't even fitting there because it got bent well what do i do it was actually the next the same day that it, this happened the same day that i purchased the gun so i i decided to take it back to shields um and and i, I explained the situation and i said you know I bought the gun uh, today, and I uh, 
I was having problems the same day. I was having problems with this. Uh, and then, you know, I unfortunately, I got it bent. I mean, I, I said, I clearly explained that. It wasn't bent like this. I caused that. But the reason why I bent that, because, you know, that's a normal question anyone would ask, how the, how the hell do you bent the, you know, the ejector rod, is because it was, the cylinder was getting stuck, and when I was trying to get it out of his housing, and I was, I was kind of hitting the gun from the, the cylinder on the edge of my table, and, and I, I almost, you know, had a frustration because I was real mad at it, and, you know, you never get mad at your things, right? And I basically got the ejector rod bent. So I said, you know, is there any way you can fix it for me? Well, Shields was kind enough to uh, ship the gun back to Rossi. And uh, eventually I said, you know, all I need is, is basically rejecting the, I'm not rejecting, repairing the ejector, gun, uh, ejector rod, right? I wanted this part, ejector rod part, to be replaced. That's what I wanted. I mean, I could have taken to a gunsmith. But I thought, you know, maybe uh, Shields uh, might help me with that. Uh, that was my thinking. And actually, they did. I should, I should uh, give this credit to them. Uh, they took the gun and uh, a little bit of a paperwork, and they shipped the gun next day back to Rossi. It was almost exactly five weeks later, yesterday, uh, they called me. Shields called me back, and they said, you know, your gun is ready uh, for pickup. So I went there evening after work and pick up my gun. And obviously, you know, the first thing I checked was, you know, hey, I want to see before you, <laughs> before I just leave the store. And it was just fine. As you see, I mean, I, this is very uh, normal function, the way of that the cylinder is uh, working. So that was a kind of a little funny story that I know I, I had with this gun. I haven't even had a chance yet to shoot with it. And I'm thinking about uh, making another maybe short video uh, shooting 357 Magnum uh, rounds. It's also shooting 38 Spatials, so it's a nice feature, you know, being able to shoot both uh, ammo because I have a lot of 38 Spatials as I have also a 38 Spatial uh, revolver. That's a Smith & Wesson Snubby I have uh, shooting only 30, 38 Spatial Plus P uh, rounds. Uh, this is also designed uh, uh, for plus P uh, rounds as well. So that's a, that's a good thing. And uh, it does have, it does have uh, still rear sides and also adjustable front side. And I want to, I want to show one more thing. So I want to cock the hammer and get it a little bit closer uh, to the camera. I believe now you can see here. Oops, I can't. It's hard to kind of uh, show like this, right? There you go. See that you know uh, little needle sticking out of the hammer on the tip of the hammer. This is a little bit of a different design. So a lot of times uh, the the needle is built in right here at the back of the barrel, right? In this case, Rossi uh, put the needle right on the on the tip of the uh, hammer. Because of that, I never do dry shooting with this. I have other guns, especially for dry shooting practice, dry practice uh, that I'm using actually Mantis uh, to do the dry shooting to measure my progress electronically with an application it has. It's you know talking to my talking to my uh, smartphone, and that's a Taurus Taurus pistol, and I can do back-to-back -back, uh, dry shooting without re-racking the gun each time. Uh, so that's a really nice thing to do, and it doesn't harm, it doesn't damage, uh, damage the gun. Uh, same thing with my uh, you know, Smith & Wesson revolver, Snobby. Uh, it's a five-shooter. But this one, because of this situation, because of the needle that I was showing you that is built on the uh, hammer, the dry shooting is absolutely not recommended because it would, it would damage that needle. So I'm not going to do that. I'm not, as you notice, not even here for uh, display pur uh, purposes. I'm not even doing this. But I want to also talk a little bit about the trigger. Again, since I haven't shot with it yet, uh, I haven't experienced the trigger weight situation in in rounding with, with live rounds in in, uh, in the shooting range. 
but I was told, and also I read about that, that this trigger is about, trigger weight is about 11 pounds. Well, that's on the heavy side, and this is a double action. So double action, uh, having a 11 pound, um, you know, I'm trying to avoid actually not to put my finger here. I just uh, kind of almost, I guess unintentionally did that. I, uh, I hate to do that. So uh, the trigger weight is, is being 11 pounds, so uh, double action. So that is that is uh, on the heavy side, and obviously it might uh, cause additional jerkiness when you're shooting with that. Uh, that is something that you know I'm gonna have to try, test it out, and see and how I can adjust it. And as you all know, each gun, particularly each trigger assembly has different types of different travel distance, different uh, pull weights, different amount of walls. Some guns, some tr trigger mechanisms have one wall, some has multiple walls, two or three even. I think Glock has, some models of Glock has three different walls, wall meaning here again after the slack. I will show for the display purposes only that I, I'm going to have to put my finger on the on the trigger for display purposes. Uh, each gun, each trigger has some slack, right? After you take up that slack, you pull it back a little bit. You kind of stop somewhere, right? That's the wall, right? So that's that's what I'm talking about. Each gun has uh, some guns have one, some guns are two, a multi uh, or or more uh, walls, and it total travel distance and also travel distance between the end of the slack uh, or between the, the starting of the slack to the wall. So I need to uh, practice with that to understand, to kind of get a feeling and get, get used to it. And I'm thinking uh, with 357 Magnum and uh, with this kind of trigger weight, the gun size I can't remember the weight, but you know what this, see that underneath of this uh, lock is adding, I think, a good amount of weight to be able to keep the gun stabilized because of its weight, this, this, this lock here. So uh, having especially, I, I, one, of the one of the reasons why I particularly like this one was the barrel length, the six inch barrel length. Um, so that is uh, something, something that I really, I think I I will enjoy, you know, shooting with six, six inch uh, barrel. Uh, the the primary purpose of this gun for me is obviously not to conceal the carry. This is uh, I typically wouldn't. I don't think a lot of people will carry concealed carry guns, uh, type of guns, you know, of this size, six mm -hmm. inch uh, barrel. So uh, I will typically use this gun to have fun, just to have fun uh, in the range, uh, shooting 357 or 38 Spatial, depending on how I feel, what I feel like. But on the other hand, you know, just a few other things I want to mention, like I said, you know, Rossi Revolvers uh, made a comeback with three different models, I said, and this is one of them, and, uh, excuse me, okay, I'm sorry, I just uh, got, I might got get distracted a little bit when I'm uh, recording because I also work from home and right now I'm kind of you know idling here and if somebody you know sends me a, a message or something I might you know be distracted anyway so yeah uh, this is uh, this is the story that I wanted to share with you and I'll, I definitely mean to record uh, videos uh, shooting with that in the range 357 magnums and, and, and see um, how that goes. You know, 357 Magnum is, is uh, pretty, uh, pretty strong with ammo. So uh, that would be a very good defensive, I, I think, gun. I mean, you know, uh, at home, a pretty good defensive gun as well. And I know that a lot of discussions uh, as far as, you know, revolvers versus uh, p the auto pistols, semi-auto pistols. And uh, I'm not one of those guys uh, thinking that, you know, revolvers are a uh, thing of past and they belong to a museum. I certainly and absolutely don't believe in that. 
I think revolvers have uh, their absolute uh, distinct advantages over uh, semi-auto pistols. That doesn't mean that, you know, by any means, any kind of, even slightest kind of discredit in the semi-auto pistols, but I'm saying that because of those discussions, and some of them are, in my opinion, are unjustly uh, placing revolvers uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a position which is much less than where they deserve to be. So they do have absolute distinct advantages. Obviously, as, as all know, everybody says uh, they never, ever get stuck, malfunction, or whatever. Uh, if one bat, you know, round comes and you cannot, you know, fire, you just keep going. The next one most likely will fire. You don't have to stop and try to uh, fix it and get, you know, get it out of the, you know, uh, uh, the ejector, uh, ejection hole and fix it and put the, you know, magazine back, all those things. So that problem is 100% not there. And the other thing is, is one other uh, advantage, and I don't think it's mostly mentioned or talked about, is uh, let's say you're in a situation that your house got broken in. Somebody's trying to break in. Somebody's trying to break in at 3 in the morning. Either your wife is screaming or you're, you heard something, you know, I don't know, glass broken or... There's a rattling on the outside of the door. You just heard it, and you realize that, okay, 3 in the morning, I haven't invited anybody, as far as I know, at this time of the day, and this is an uninvited guest. And then with that, you grab your gun and try to uh, deal with the situation as best as you can. Let's say uh, the intruder is inside your house, in a situation, there, there are lots of different po possibilities, lots of different permutations that can happen, right? And assume that one of them is such that while you're holding your gun, let's say it's a semi-auto, you're holding a gun, somehow you're in a very close contact with the intruder. I mean, you're almost wrestling. I mean, you're wrestling, let's say. He attack you, he, he just jump at you, you're holding your gun, but he only jumped at you, and you're in a situation that you can actually press your gun against his body. Press your gun against his body. And you want to shoot him that time. Otherwise, you know that he's going to kill you or very badly damage you. So when you do depress the gun, the semi-pistol, semi-auto pistol, against to, you know, imagine that... This is the intruder's body, and you you just depress, you just, you know, do this, and try to pull the trigger with your semi-auto. Because of the semi-auto's uh, structure, the, rack, the action part, the way it works, its physics, its mechanics, it kind of might get misaligned. Those things might get out of alignment. And when you pull the trigger, it may not work, it may not fire, it may not get discharged. That's another possibility with a semi-auto pistol. On the other hand, the same situation. This is the intruder's body, you do this, and you pull the trigger with this revolver, or with any revolver. There is no possibility that the gun is not gonna fire. Gun will fire, 100% of the time of each of those conditions and situations or scenarios. So that's that's one other distinction, one other advantage of revolvers over uh, semi-auto pistols. Of course, you know, the one uh, most frequent, without even, I don't even need to repeat it, but I will, that, well, this gun only takes six rounds, right? Six rounds. Some of them are five. The most takes eight. Most. Well, that's not a lot of ammo. And you can find a lot of uh, discussions. Rightfully so. I'm not going to go, uh, I'm not going to argue against. That's that's absolutely correct. The other day I was watching an officer um, on, on a video. 
uh, or actually a commentator, he's also a cop, in, or ex-cop, I think, and he was talking about just that and saying that, you know, why, especially a cop might uh, carry on the average, like, I don't know, 36 or 48 rounds of ammo on him, on his body, on his person, uh, while on duty. That's, that's absolutely, you know, I agree with that. I'm not going to argue against it. But we're talking about uh, responsibly armed citizens, not police officers. The citizens, the private citizens uh, who are trying to defend themselves, uh, self-protection or protecting their loved ones and family and kids and children or their dwellings. So a lot of times, you know, uh, civilian uh, may not be in a situation where with extra you know, pockets to carry extra magazines with, you know, I don't know, 36, 48, or 76, you know, uh, rounds of uh, ammo. And now the, the, the discussion about, uh, the discussion about this very limited amount of ammo that can be carried on a revolver, just six. And obviously, if you need to reload it, the difficulty coming with that as opposed to semi-auto. That's a distinct disadvantage that revolver has versus revol uh, semi-auto, right? The thing is, is the fact that you know that you have six rounds, that means you have six maximum shots. I think it's a, it's a situation where whether some people would agree with this or disagree with this, but I'm going to say it anyway. You have a tendency, no, in this situation, you have a tendency to use your rounds a lot more carefully. Imagine you have, for instance, I have a Caltech. Uh, it takes uh, 30 rounds of 22 LRs, 22, LR, uh, 22 Magnums, actually, those are. It takes 30 of them. If you have 30 rounds in your magazine, the way you're going to use them is not going to be the same versus the one like, in, like this gun. You have only six rounds. It's a human nature. It's a human psychology. There is a situation called shoot and pray. You're shooting and you're hoping to hit, hit the target. It may be hit. It may not. But no problem. I have a lot of rounds. I can keep shooting. I can kind of spray kind of shooting. Whereas with this, you know that you're not going to do that. You know that you're not going to sp do sh uh, spray shooting uh, and you will use each and every round with absolute highest amount of care. That means every, every count, I mean every round counts a lot. So that's another advantage and obviously one other one that I, I like revolves is, is the fact that, like I said, it's a double action, right? But if you want more accuracy for each time before you shoot and you only have six rounds, you cock this hammer and now look how close the trigger is all the way back to the trigger wall, all the way back to the trigger guard. There's almost no distance. It's almost touching. It's not touching, but it's so close. Uh, there you go. See how close it is to the back of the trigger guard, uh, trigger guard. So with that now, anymore, it's not even close to 11 pounds of you know trigger pull. It's basically just a just a felt touch, a little bit of a touch. With that, the gun is gonna fire. So. Um, that kind of accuracy is not there with semi-auto pistols. Some people may argue against that, but according to statistics, the revolvers that are basically uh, during those tests, shooting tests, made by machines, like you know, installing the gun actually on a system, on a kind of a, uh, a mechanism where a gun is absolutely still because it's not a person, human being holding it. It's a machine holding in its place in an extremely tight manner. 
and, and a trigger gets pulled by the machine. And that kind of those kind of tests at various differences, distances, 20, uh, 20 yards, 25 yards, those are, those are good distances, right, for uh, handguns, real good distances. And their accuracy is comparable to rifle accuracy at those distances. To achieve those kinds of accuracies with semi-pistols is very, very difficult. Revolvers, in this case, is a lot more accurate. So there is accuracy. Yes, you have less rounds, but with this kind of accuracy, especially after cocking the hammer, cocking the gun like that, if you are, uh, if you can collect yourself in a situation where you have to defend yourself or your house or your family, if you are all collected and calm. I know it's not easy, but if you can, you're gonna have absolutely a lot higher chances to see to, to hit the target that you intend to hit. The intruder. The bad guy entering your house to steal your things, maybe to damage, to hurt your family, your wife, your children, or yourself. Once the intruder is in, in the house, as you all know, the castle doctrine uh, gets triggered in, in, the, in the legal system, where you don't have to withdraw, you don't have to escape, you can stand your ground, and you can, uh, you can defend your house, your family, your children, your wife, your loved ones. It can be anyone, actually, uh, your friend, uh, your guests, uh, in fact, you know, you can defend even somebody you don't even know in the name of humanity, being good Samaritan. You're in your house. You don't have to defend. You don't have to withdraw. You don't have to leave the scene and escape. That's your last stand, stance. And then intruder is inside the house, and you have this. You have good defense. So the shortest story is, is, Revolvers, in my opinion, absolutely are not a thing of past. They have a place definitely in the gun uh, parlor, and they will remain. They will keep their, uh, I think, position and status. Yes, I know the, uh, the police force after, I don't remember exact, there is not exact date, but kind of like a, I believe it was as of 80s, uh, the entire police force gradually started moving away from revolvers, and they, right now every, every single police officer is carrying, uh, carrying an auto pistol, some auto pistol, lots of Glocks, lots of Glocks, or if you look at the military, lots of six hours, uh, or, or uh, I don't know, private uh, uh, operations, other services of the, the branches of the military. Uh, the six hours and Glocks and with the police force. So you're not seeing a lot of police officers. That's another uh, reasoning, and which which makes sense to me. I mean, you know, people seeing the police officers with uh, carrying only pistols, and people might think, okay, you know, they're in the business. They know this thing best, right? The police departments. They know what kind of gun to carry. They know what kind of gun to uh, arm with. You know, arm with their 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 officers. So uh, it should be the right way, therefore revolvers are wrong. That's, that's kind of, you know, a little bit of a fallacy, I think. I mean, that's correct. You know, they obviously know what they're doing, and they have, a, they have valid reasons not to carry revolvers. Because, like I said, the police officer who's engaged in, what, in the situations where they have to use a lot of ammo, uh, they have to use a, a semi-auto where they can use a lot of spare magazines. Each one of them is maybe carrying 13 or 16 rounds. If they have five of them, let's say 16, uh, 80 total rounds available to them. Uh, 80 plus the, the one, uh, 16 in the gun, so 66 plus one in the, in the barrel, 67. So that's a lot of uh, rounds, and if, that, if there are like three police officers, there you go, all of a sudden there's a lot of firepower. Uh, but depending, obviously, depending against, you know, depending on the person who is who's there engaging with. So, uh, but that's a different situation. Again, this is for the police officers who are, uh, by their de by definition, by their job, they have to 
engage and in, involved with situations where they need to use a lot of ammo. But again, you know, what we're talking about here is the self-defense for private citizens who are, who, is, who is responsibly armed, who has, uh, who can legally carry guns, who is, who has complete understanding of uh, the legal implications of one, carrying the gun and two, using the gun for defensive purposes, resorting to uh, deadly force to protect his own self or his family, loved ones. That most of, most of times, you know, this situation does not warrant to have uh, access to 80 rounds. So in this case, uh, if you put these things in a context, and having a revolver like this at home, to me, and it's not the only gun I have home, obviously, but I think this is one of the good selections for home defense as well. Handgun and handguns obviously have a lot a lot of distinct advantages tactical advantages versus shotguns versus rifles even ar-15s even if they're uh, kind of tactical length it's after all short handgun that's why hence it's called handgun and if you can if you are practiced well this can become a real good weapon in your hands with a lot of tactical and strategic advantages so yes, revolvers are they don't they're not past they're not thinking of a past, they don't belong to the museum. They definitely have a rightful place in the gun parlor. Thank you very much. I appreciate watching my video. Uh, I hope you know we can meet again on my next video. Stay safe.